thought. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at our Savior's this morning. I'm Pastor Kiri. Pastor Maria is preaching this morning. Uh, you know what someone told me this morning? Tomorrow's the first day of spring. <laughs> what? I was like, what? Hey, at least the sun is shining, right? 
And there is hope that spring is coming. Uh, a special welcome to any of you who may be visitors this morning. We'd love to connect with you, and we do have a connection card in the pews in front of you. If you want to find that and fill it out, you can turn it in at the reception desk. If you are worshiping online, a special welcome to you. We do have a connection card on our website under Connect, and we'd love for you to fill that out as well. Well, we are continuing our sermon series this morning called Seeking, and this morning's question is, who sinned? Next week's question is, can these bones live? And it is the season of Lent, so our Wednesday Lenten worship services continue. Those are at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. We have a speaker, uh, part of our speaker series directed towards our middle school and high school students and families, but all are welcome. This week it is Danielle Teachin. She's just a wonderful speaker who will be talking about, uh, and connects with people so well, talking about how to embrace the risks and the full life that God desires for us. So that's this... That's Wednesday at 5.30. Just a couple other quick things. Our first communion class is coming up. If you're, uh, if you as a family, I believe your child is ready, we, that's for ages, uh, for any age, you can talk uh, to our CYF staff about that and see how to register. And then we have a family movie night coming up. That is on Friday, and I understand that it is baseball-themed. So um, it was so great. Last movie night, we had kids and blankets out in the gathering space, kind of almost filling the space. So uh, think about coming if you would like to come Friday night as a family. Well, those are all of the announcements, so I invite you to stand. And in our places, we will greet one another with God's peace, with a smile or a wave. Please remain standing for our opening song. We're going to sing an oldie but a favorite of ours. Lift your head, weary sinner. The river's just ahead. Down the path of forgiveness. Salvation's waiting there. You build a mighty fortress, 10,000 burdens high. Love is here to lift you up, here to lift you high. If you're lost and wandering, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling, let the gates of glory open wide. Who strayed and walked away Unspeakable things you've done Fix your eyes on the mountain Let the past be dead and gone Come all saints and sinners You can't outrun God Whatever you've done can't overcome The power of the blood If you're lost and wandering
stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. If you're lost and wrecked again, come stumbling in like a prodigal child. See the walls start crumbling. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. Let the gates of glory open wide. You may be seated. We're all so used to hearing that echo that John, the sound <laughs> check, uh, usually puts in, but uh, it kind of we kind of missed it this morning, huh? Um, this morning, uh, Pastor Maria is going to be preaching about. Um, when Jesus put mud on the blind man's eyes and healed him. Um, but before that happened, the disciples asked, who, who sinned, him or his parents? And I think um, it can relate to us a lot these days um, in, the, in America, in this world. We have a lot of prejudices. We have a lot of walls that we um, inadvertently have. And... Um, we are still learning. We are still growing as people. And one of the things that um, our faith, our, our um, love of Jesus can help us with is learning how to um, break down those walls and reach out to people and love them the way Jesus loves them. So as we sing We Praise You, there's a part in the chorus where it says, We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. And God is able to overcome all of our fear. He's over, able to overcome a lot of things that maybe we think can't be overcome. So let's worship together and sing We Praise You. Two, three, four. This is what living looks like. This is what 
what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. For fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift you high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, 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 we praise you. Let us pray. Father God, this winter seems terminably long. Frustrations boil up inside of me, and I feel some days I don't know how I can keep going. The hurt and longing for something different comes upon me. My faults come before me, and then I remember the line from the parable of the prodigal son. When the father saw him, he ran to him. He didn't stand and wait for him to be clean. He didn't stand and wait for him to be pure. He ran to him and embraced him in all of his pain, in all of his dirt and filth, in all of the pain he suffers. I know, Lord, that you come and you are running toward me at this moment. Bless us and keep us through this season of Lent. Help us to remember that you continue to seek us, that you continue to run headlong toward us. Right, kids, it is time for the children's offering and message. Come on up. Come on up. Nathan's got the milk can for your offerings. Oh, NDSU, nice. Go Bison. <laughs> you tell her, not me. <laughs> Pastor Curie's going to have a word with you after because you got North Dakota gear and she went to South Dakota. So, yeah. <laughs> it's okay to cheer for your own team. That's fine. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good to see you guys. We are spending a few weeks here at church asking questions because when we ask questions, guess what? We learn stuff. So I have some questions for you today about this Play-Doh. I put it in a paper, I put it in a little Ziploc bag because if I tried to dig it out of this little Play-Doh can while you were up here, it would get all in my fingernails and make a mess. So what happens if I take this Play-Doh, play uh -huh, easy for me to say, and I mush it into this little lion mold? Yeah, it's going to look like a lion. So let's do that. It's going to look like a lion. Let's, now, if I take it out carefully, there we go. Looks like a lion. Fantastic. Now, if I, now if I take this little lion, can I, like, set him back in the mold? Will he fit? Will he fit? Cause, yeah, because he just came from there, right? Now, what's gonna, what would happen if I take this lion and I try to put him into this little bunny rabbit mold. It's not going to work. Yeah, it's, so it's not going to fit. Now we've smushed the lion. It doesn't look like a lion anymore. And it doesn't, it also does not look like a bunny rabbit. <laughs> it's just a giant mess, right? That's what happens when you try to put something in the wrong mold and it just doesn't fit. Well, in our Bible story today, people are trying to answer the question, who is Jesus? Okay, And they all have a different idea in mind of who he is. Kind of like they have a little mold that they want him to fit into. So let me tell you what happened. Okay, So Jesus and his disciples, they're in the city of Jerusalem. And they meet a man who has never been able to see. He's been blind since the day he was born. And Jesus heals him in a super gross way. 
Are you ready for the gross this morning? All right. So Jesus spit on the ground, and then he, and then he made mud with the dirt and his spit, and then he put it on the man's eyes. Ugh. Do not try this at home. We are not Jesus, okay? And then he told the man to go wash off the mud, and so the man went and he washed off the mud, and he could see. That's how Jesus healed him. So now... This has happened, and people are trying to figure out who Jesus is, right? Who is this guy who can heal a man who was born blind? And the religious leaders, the churchy people, they can't figure it out. Because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, which was a holy day of rest, right? So this was breaking the rules. So the religious leaders, they're just confused. They've got a mold in mind of what somebody sent by God would be like. So they think Jesus can't possibly be from God if he's breaking the Sabbath rules. It's like they expect him to be like a lion, but he shows up and he's like a bunny rabbit. And they just don't get it, right? They're confused. So you know who's not confused? The man who Jesus healed, right? By the end of the story, Jesus and the man have a conversation. And Jesus says that he is sent by God. And if the man has a mold in his head of what he thinks that means, he does not let that get in the way. He knows Jesus heals him, healed him, and he believes that Jesus is from God. So he worships him. You know, sometimes we might have an idea of what somebody's going to be like, and we might be right, or we might be wrong. So when you're meeting new friends and meeting new people, it's good to keep an open mind of what they're going to be like, because... They may or may not match the mold that we have in our head, kind of like Jesus. All right, let's fold our hands and close our eyes and let's pray. And repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for Plato. Thank you for doctors and for medicine that heals. Thank you for the man Jesus healed. Help us see people for who they are. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thanks for coming up. You can use your walking feet as you head out to children's ministry. And if you're staying in here, you can head back to your families. <laughs> gospel this morning comes from the gospel according to John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back, able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen the man before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, it is he. Others were saying, no, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and washed. Then I went and washed and received my sight. 
they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, he put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, he is a prophet. The gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, this is the fourth week in our Seeking series where we're exploring questions asked by people in the Bible. And as we look at their questions and where those questions led them, we ask our own questions. We ask questions as we engage in the spiritual practice of seeking. It can be easier sometimes to think that we already know the answers. And we do know some things, right? We know that God is good and that God sent Jesus for us and for all the world. But to dig deeper in our faith, the spiritual practice of seeking is a wonderful tool. It frees us to let go of assumptions and ask all kinds of questions, being open to whatever answers God might have for us, and being open to the possibility that there may not always be answers. Have you had those moments in life when something bad happens and you wonder why? And then you analyze it and you pray about it and you realize that for this one there is no answer? Yeah. Not all questions have an answer. But there's value in asking the question. When we ask questions and we wrestle with things, we engage with life and with God. Rather than holding everything at arm's length, including God, we enter into conversation and question and reflection that brings us closer to God and leads to fuller life, regardless of whether or not there's a clear answer. Today we have the story of an unnamed man who was born blind. It's a story where everybody asks questions. Now, I am a firm believer that there's no such thing as a stupid question. However, as we look, right, as we look at this story, a number of people could have asked better questions. And those better questions might have changed the outcome. So we're in John chapter 9, one of my favorite chapters. I'm going to nerd out on you this morning, so buckle up. Um, it's on page 871 in the Pew Bibles, if you want to take a look while we're talking about it. Um, so let's look, page 871. Let's look at some of those questions, and let's see what they can teach us about asking better questions that lead to understanding and clarity. So we've got Jesus and his disciples, they're walking through Jerusalem and they encounter this man who had been blind since birth. The first question in the story comes from the disciples. They ask Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? That is an interesting question. Who sinned? Their question assumes that illness and disability are the result of sin. It assumes that the man deserved to be born blind. It assumes that physical blindness is a form of failure in some way. But none of those assumptions are true, right? I mean, God love them. The disciples have been raised with this idea that that's how God works. So those false assumptions inform the first question they ask. What if they had asked a better question? What if, instead of asking whose fault it is, they asked, how could we heal or help this man? How might that have changed the story? 
As I said, John 9 is one of my favorite Bible stories because even today, people struggle with this idea of cause and effect, right? If something goes wrong in our lives, we ask, what did I do to deserve this? It's a natural question, but it's based on false assumptions. It assumes that all suffering is due to God's judgment in some way. And the reason I love John 9 is that the disciples ask who sinned, and the whole rest of the story explains that God doesn't work that way. God doesn't work that way. The man was born blind. And since he was born blind, and since Jesus has now encountered him, this becomes an opportunity for God's healing power to be revealed in Jesus. Jesus heals the man, and now the neighbors are the next ones with questions. They ask each other, isn't this the guy who was blind? And I think it's hilarious that they don't ask the guy, right? They're just talking amongst themselves. Isn't that the guy? What is that about? Why don't they just ask the person who, who would know the answer? Ask the man himself. But at any rate... The man who can now see, he overhears this conversation and says, yeah, it's me. It's me. And rather than recognize the miracle that has taken place, the neighbors begin to grill him about the mechanics of how he was healed. How were your eyes opened? The man explains that the man called Jesus did it. Well, where is this Jesus? I don't know. Neighbors are concerned that something funny is going on. So they take the man to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees also ask him how he received his sight. He tells them, and it leads these religious leaders to a whole other host of questions and assumptions. Some of them say because Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, he can't be from God. Others ask, how can a man who's a sinner perform such signs? which is actually a good question, but it starts with a bad assumption that Jesus is a sinner. What if they had started by simply asking, how can Jesus perform such signs? Without the burden of this idea that healing on the Sabbath is a violation of religious law and is a sin, without this mold that they have in their minds about what it looks like to be a person of God, the Pharisees might have recognized the miracle that happened. They might have asked, how could Jesus perform this sign? And the answer could have been, is it possible that Jesus is from God? Their assumptions blinded them to that possibility. Now, fortunately, because they were stumped, they asked the man who was healed, well, what do you say about Jesus? And the man says, he's a prophet. I want to stop here for a minute. Because throughout this entire story, people ask questions based on false assumptions. Without those assumptions, they might have asked better questions. Questions that would have led them to a better understanding of who Jesus is. And at the same time, the more questions that are asked of the man who was healed, the more clear his understanding of Jesus becomes. So listen to the progression of his answers when he's asked who Jesus is. Okay? So who's Jesus? Verse 11, the man called Jesus. Verse 17, he's a prophet. Verse 25, I don't know whether he's a sinner. I know I was blind and now I see. Verse 33, he's a man from God, because if he were not from God, he could do nothing. At that point, the man gets kicked out of the synagogue for heresy. Jesus hears about it. He finds the man and asks, do you believe in the Son of Man? And the man asks Jesus a great question. Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus says, it's me. 
And the man believes the answer. He says, Lord, I believe, and worships Jesus. Now, if you go home today, and you read through this entire chapter, you'll see that most of the people asking questions don't believe the answers. And it's not just that they don't believe the answers. I think it's more that they can't comprehend the answers. It doesn't compute because the answers don't fit into their mold, into their preconceived ideas they have in their minds. Have you ever watched Say Yes to the Dress? Or walked past when it was on? Okay. It's like a bride who goes in thinking she wants a ball gown and then falls in love with a mermaid dress. Okay? It blows her mind. And there's usually one person in her entourage who cannot get on board because they've always imagined her getting married in a ball gown. Right? Those preconceived notions need to get thrown out the window if there's going to be a bride who's happy with her dress. Okay? And in John 9, so many of the people asking questions about Jesus have preconceived notions that also need to get thrown out the window if they're going to be able to see that Jesus is the Messiah. I'm not making this up. In the middle of the story, starting in verse 18, questions are being asked in order to find out if this recently healed man believes Jesus is the Messiah. That's what those questions are about in that part. Because in that place and time, if you believed Jesus was the Messiah, you were kicked out of the synagogue. It says so in verse 22. So the religious leaders, they weren't asking questions with the goal of understanding what happened and what that might mean about who Jesus is. Nope. They assumed that the Messiah would never heal on the Sabbath. So they were asking questions with the intent of driving this man out of the synagogue and proving that Jesus is a heretic. Okay. So at least two different things are going on. Right? Number one, the religious leaders have these false assumptions about sin and illness and how all that works, about healing on the Sabbath, and about what the Messiah would be like. They have all of these preconceived notions, these molds in their minds, and those are really hard to overcome. So those false assumptions shape the questions they ask. And I have empathy for them, because we all make bad assumptions from time to time. There are times we could ask better questions. Right? The other thing going on is that the religious leaders don't fully listen to the answers. And again, some of their inability to accept the answers comes from false assumptions, but some of it might just be coming from stubbornness, right? They're not open to hearing the witness of this man who had been born blind. After the man's testimony, at the end of the chapter, they still hold on to their assumption that someone must have sinned in order for this man to have been born blind. They can't see the truth. So who actually sees in this story? Who understands what happened and believes who Jesus is? It's not the religious leaders. It's the man who was born blind. He sees in more than one way. There are two things I want us to take from this story today. Number one, there's not always a cause and effect for bad things in life. When the disciples asked who sinned, Jesus' response was that God doesn't work that way. And Jesus would know. God does not work that way. And number two, it's good to pay attention to the questions we ask. When we're going to ask a questions, question, let's ask ourselves, what assumptions do I carry? Because we all make assumptions. So what are those assumptions? And how might we ask questions that leave room for the possibility that some of our assumptions might be wrong? What's the intent with our questions? 
when, our, when we're seeking clarity or understanding, which I think is what most questions are about, what are better questions we can ask? The man who was healed asked good questions and came to a clear understanding of who Jesus is. May we do the same as we seek to love and to understand God and our neighbors. Amen.
We take time now in prayer to speak and to listen. Let us pray. Loving God, break open our assumptions. Lead us to ask good questions as we seek greater understanding. Inspire us by your love as together we strive for justice and peace in all the earth. And God, by your word, you have made all things. Teach us to notice the beauty and the breadth of your creation. From the mountains to the smallest springtime buds, nourish the earth and teach us to sustain it. Be with those who are impacted by recent storms and earthquakes. May they see you in the faces of one another and in those who help them in this time of need. And God, you are powerful. Guide the work of heads of state and elected officials. Encourage them to lead with justice for the dignity of all. And Lord, we pray for peace in the world, especially in Ukraine. And God, you lead us beside still waters and restore our souls. Keep watch over those who weep and tend to all who are sick. We name before you today Daniel Schmitz Jr., Dick Potsmith, Jerome Bokelman, Heidi Wyatt, Ron O'Lean, Mary Wells, Audrey Lundstrom, Randy Hill Jr., Michelle Leslie, Lynn Gleason, David Kappelhoff, Sherry, Jovita Romero, Brenda Varney, and Pat Nelson. And Lord, we pray for your comfort for those who grieve, for Carol Svendahl and family at the death of her husband, Alan, and for Rick and Kristen True and family at the death of wife and mother, Lisa True. God, we give thanks. You are merciful and you don't keep score. You create, you heal with mud and you see what we cannot. You save and you heal and you greet our questions with patience to send us out with hope in our step. Lord, hear us when we pray. Amen. Well, it's time for us to consider our offering. We give thanks for all the gifts that our ministry gifts shared here at Our Saviors. So there are various ways you can give. You can, if you're here in person, you can place your offering in the baskets as you leave this morning. You can also always mail in a check. You can uh, use the QR code to download the Vanco app and give electronically or give through our website, OurSaviorsLC.org. Let's pray as we give thanks to God for all the gifts that are shared today. Generous God, you seek us out and you give us good things. As we share these resources to spread your good news, help us seek out the hungry and the weary, the hopeful and the faithful. Remind us to seek the good in every person we pass knowing that you can be found in each of us and in this meal of bread and wine. Amen. As we prepare for communion today, I, uh, the most important thing is to know that all are welcome to share communion here at Our Saviors and receive the gifts of God's grace and love. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. We join together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For communion today, you can either come forward for communion or commune in your seats with the kit you can get from the ushers. Uh, once the communion servers are ready at the front of your station, they'll give you a nod. You can come forward row by row from front to back. Middle sections, you'll come down the center aisle and go back by the side uh, aisles. Outside sections, you'll come along the wall and then go back by those same aisles. When you reach the front of your station, simply hold out your hands. We'll drop a wafer into your hands. You can then step to the next server and dip the wafer into the chalice. The red is wine. The white is grape juice. You may then eat those together and return to your seats. 
If you have someone with you who doesn't take communion, please have them come forward to receive a blessing. And if you need gluten-free wafers, those are available at the front of each section, and additional details are on the front of your happenings. So for those communing in place or at home, as you open your kits and receive the meal, hear these words, the body of Christ given for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite the communion servers forward.
Please stand as you are able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Seeking God, we look for you in the mirror, in strangers, in sunrises, in the laughter of children, and in meals shared together. At this table, all are fed, all are welcomed, and there is room for everyone. At this table, you meet us in our seeking, and we see you clearly. Gratefully, we pray. Amen. And receive the blessing. As you leave this place, may God bless you with seeking. As you seek and as you wonder, may you find what you are looking for. Now receive the blessing of our loving God, who is always seeking us. Amen.
go in peace, keep on seeking. We will. Thanks be to God. Shout to all the earth. The King is coming. The King is coming. Christ, he shall return. The King is coming. The King is coming. Shout. Jay solo at the A end. Never hurts anybody. <laughs> <laughs>